thank you very much, Professor Song. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. I'm very happy. I really like uh, China. And I want to uh, show you what we have been working. I don't know how to pass this. OK, now I know. On um, 2D materials. Uh, and as you know, this story started with, I don't know how to pass them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's what's wrong? Okay. 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 Okay, okay, okay. No. 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 Because it has something here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, and this work on 2D materials started uh, almost 24 years ago, and it was with the discovery of graphene. But this wasn't a real discovery. It was the isolation of one monolayer of graphite of graphene from graphite. You know, everybody knows that the graphene. It's coming from graphite, and this gave the Nobel Prize to these two researchers. They are Game Novoselov and Cos uh, 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 Game Game Andrew Game and uh, Kostas Novoselov. And you know, since then we know that graphene it has a lot of properties. It's the most resistant materials mechanically, chemically, it's thermally stable, and it's passing along. <laughs> And, uh, and all these properties of graphene were measured by them. This wasn't an easy job because as you know, you that work in the lab, that uh, work with the small materials is not always uh, very easy. They need to take one sheet of one atom thick to measure all the properties and to move from one characterization technique to the other and to invent new methodologies to characterize these materials. Uh, but why, if we have graphite in our pencil, why we don't have all these properties in this graphite if it's made of graphene? But good. The reason it is because a, a, a physics equation, that is the direct, direct equation, direct uh, that when we have a material like in graphite, we have all the layers, graphene layers that are interacting between each other. Electrons are coupled between these sheets. And then we can not see the quantical properties of this material. But what happened was we remove one layer and we have the isolated graphene sheet, then electrons are free and they can move freely under all the surface, on top of all the surface, and these electrons are moving close to the velocity of light. And that's the reason why this 2D material has all these properties, because with the couple of electrons, these electrons are free, they can freely move all over the surface. And if you can imagine, if you have a material where electrons are moving very fast, then uh, it will be mechanically very strong. It will conduct charges. It will uh, the positive negative uh, charges will move very fast on the surface. And also, this type of materials they can move uh, ions or and holes are the best material for conducted charges. And this is very important because. Uh, in, in nature, we have many different uh, materials or minerals. For example, mica. Uh, the, the vermiculite, it is a, a very well-known material the, that the Romans, they already work with it. And it's called vermiculite because vermiculare means for breathing worms. And this material, this mica, when it is in the humidity and the temperature, uh, correct ones, uh, they start 
to expand forming this type of worms. And this material has been used for a lot of time in the crops or in concrete as an additive for keep the temperature and isolator material. Also, it's good in packing material because it protects the things. And another very well-known uh, layer of material is called Moscovita. That is the common mica. Probably if you do AFM a characterization, you can, you might be, you use it. This material, the mica, is very flat and then you can put molecules or other materials on top and measure by atomic form microscopy this. This is a electrical isolator. It doesn't conduct charge. That's why you can use it as a software for AFM. It's an electric and it's very, very flat. Uh, why? I don't know why it's not moving. It is because that, that is this uh, here. Yeah, there's problem with that software. Okay, and, and then here we have uh, the different type of 2D materials. Graphene is the only one that is really one atom thick. The rest, they have one and a half atoms or three atoms or four atoms or so on. But all of them, the, the, the main quality is that they are layered materials. Uh, uh, in the case of corniculite, for example, there are ions between the layers, and this the reason why are very easy exfoliated. And we have all the metal transitions, the calcogenides, that now are very important because this type of material of molybden, disulfide or molybdenite, are very uh, good for semiconducting applications. And also we have some metal oxides and uh, manganese oxide. This, all of this material, you can see the minerals and you can see the exfoliated materials and the properties of them are completely different from one to the other. I, again, in the case of molybdenite, we have, uh, this is the mineral that is found in nature. And when you take out one of these layers, then materials uh, properties are completely different. In this case, uh, molybdenite, the bulk, is a, a semiconductor with an indirect band gap. And when we have a monolayer molybdenite, we have a, a semiconductor with direct band gap in the point K of the Brillow zone. What does it mean? It is that, okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. And thank you. It means that what it is on this side is the bulk material. And if you see the electronic. Uh, States the electronic state, these blue lines are what the electrons are in the material. They have the maximum in the conduction band, in the maximum in the balance band, it's not at the same point that is the conduction band. It's when we have a monolayer. These points are in the same place, in the K point, and we have a semiconductor with direct transition. transition. And these materials are important because they can interact with the electromagnetic field in a very, uh, in a very uh, controlled manner. And, uh, I guess there are many types of 2D materials, all of them 
fire in nature and in minerals, but also now researchers, uh, theoretical researchers, have been working this class for many different applications. And the, the, the researchers have discovered more than 1,000 new 2D materials, and uh, they are waiting for the chemist people to work on the synthesis of these new materials. But now in nature, we have all this stuff. You can see that in, in the top, we have a hexagonal boron nitride that is an isolator. It doesn't conduct electricity. We have graphene and germanine, estanine, and there are uh, uh, semi-metals. They don't have a, 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 a conduction, a band gap. And we have metals and superconductors that are vanadites or titanites of homogenite uh, metal transition materials that are semiconducting, and also the, the common one as uh, indium selenite or um, sulfur uh, gallium. And all these materials, they interact with the electrochemical, with the electron, electromagnetic spectra. And then instead of modifying materials, we can choose one of them to interact in the different regions of the electromagnetic spectra. For example, they can protect us from the UV radiation. They can be uh, shields uh, for protection of the electronic waves. And also, they can interact in the visible range for uh, the development of photocatalysts. They can also uh, work in the infrared for the development of uh, technology, as for example, antenna for the uh, transmission of signals, also in the microwave, and so on. You can choose the material and develop an application of this material. They, this material, uh, conduct electricity very efficiently. Uh, they conduct charge as well, and they have very large surface areas that is very important for applications. If you want to do catalysts, it is very important to have a very, a very large surface area. They are flexible and they are very mechanical. Uh, they are resistant mechanically and thermally, chemically to different environments. That's why these type of materials are very important now. And here uh, we have uh, this that I, I mentioned. If we have uh, a band gap, uh, uh, larger than five electron volts, then we have a light isolator. If we have a band gap between one and two electron volts, we have a semiconductor. If we don't have uh, a band gap, we can have semi-metals of semi-metals. And if we don't have uh, any band gap, we have met, uh, metal, metallic behavior or, <laughs> or superconductor behavior. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, we don't have only the properties of the isolated to the materials. The Nobel Prize, as I mentioned before, they also proposed that we can uh, prepare mixtures of these materials, like, for example, that it's there. It's called Alego, that is where the children, they, they uh, 
the the child they uh, play with this structure and they can uh, assemble a mixture of these two materials. Uh, they this type of, of material might have completely different properties, and we can imagine everything that we want with this type of materials. And these materials are called van der Waals electrostructures because uh, the layers, they don't interact covalently. They don't form co covalent bonds. They just interact by weak forces that are called van der Waals electrostatic forces. And uh, these type of materials, they have a lot of properties, very different properties. We can control, for example, the optical properties, the magnetic properties, and the ferromagnetic properties by just uh, pushing tension of these sheets. We can put a strain of them, and for example, that that there, if if we have a graphene sheet with the right curvature, we can uh, convert a uh, white lines in blue light, in blue light, just but stretching the sheet. Also, uh, when we uh, uh, strain these materi materials, we can produce magnetism or we can conduct ferroelectricity because spins on the materials are arranged in different configurations. Another thing that it is very important in this material is that if we have a monolayer, for example, in this case is graphene, the properties will be will be different than if we have two layers. And if we have two layers, we can change the properties by changing little by little the the angles on which these properties, these materials interact between each other. This is called twistronics. And uh, it means that if we change a little bit the angle between the two layers of graphene, the, they will form this type of structures that I call incommensurate or commensurate structures. And the coupling between the electrons between these layers, it will produce very, very important application. For example, if we rotate one atom of graphene sheet with respect to the other by 0.1 uh, degrees, then we will have super conduction at uh, room temperature. And that's why this type of material are so exciting because we can control the uh, electronic properties just by changing um, the configuration of these materials. Okay, but how we produce these materials? There are different methodologies. Uh, the one that the Nobel Prize used, it was to take a, a crystal of graphite and then use a scotch tape and start to take one by one the sheets uh, in the masking tape. And then they deposit on a, a silicon uh, oxide uh, wafer. And with this, they can start measure this, but can you imagine taking what one by one the graphene sheets? It's a lot of work. Uh, there are all other uh, physical methodologies that are very expensive because you need you need to have ultra high vacuum and a lot of energy to produce graphene from carbon atoms. And the technique that is more used now for electronic application is the CBD, the chemical vapor deposition synthesis, what you have an, uh, uh, a quartz um, tube and you put a, a gas, a flux of gas and the precursors and you heat this in an oven and then you start uh, the growing on a catalyst surface. This is very used for all the electronic applications uh, if you want to do transistors or if you want to do chips, then you work with the CBD. But if you want to develop chemical applications, for example, catalysts or sensors or another chemical uh, uh, material, then the best is to use the liquid phase exfoliation. How this is work is that you start with a, a small crystals of the mineral. It, it can be any 
mineral layer mineral and that you use uh, the right solvents where you need to take care uh, uh, about the interaction the thermodynamical interaction between the the crystal and the solvent you need to have an absorption energy adequate for the exfoliation of the materials and that you use ultrasonications and with this we can finish with a stable dispersions of these materials. And uh, uh, here is an example. For example, this is molybdenite that is prepared by mechanical exfoliation. This is uh, like the Nobel Prize with the scotch tape. It's a chemical vapor deposition. It's grown on a, on a surface, a liquid phase exfoliation. And the way we have to know that we really have monolayer, one single crystal, is by Raman spectroscopy. We can identify the vibration modes that are characteristic of these sheets. And if you see, if you compare the Raman spectra of this material, they are pretty much the same. We have the two vibrations out of the plane of these atoms. And the thing that changed is that part there, and this is the interaction with the substrate. If you see the CBD, it has this red uh, absorption there, the Raman uh, uh, signal, and it is uh, because it's interacting with the substrate where it was grown. And also the mechanical exfoliation, it has a signal there that is also the interaction on the surface where it is. And the liquid phase, we don't have this signal because they are on the liquid and then they don't interact with the, uh, with the surface. Another way to know that we have a monolayer of material, this is molybdenite, it is by a, a fluorescence spectroscopy. Because as I mentioned before, when we have a bulk material, these materials have an indirect band gap. But we, when we have a monolayer, this uh, material change for, for a direct band gap, and this is uh, responsible for this material when it's a monolayer is fluorescence. We have an exciton that is forming there, and it has this uh, electron volts energy that is 1.8 approximately, and and we can see that we have the fluorescence in the uh, for the three types of molybdenum disulfide, the one pro produced by the masking tape, the CBD, and the liquid white exfoliation. With this, it's just to, to show you that it doesn't matter how you prepare your material. You can have monolayers uh, in, any, in any of these methodologies. And uh, here is, uh, if you see, this is a, a, a PEM of the material. If you see, the monolayers are just on the, on the borders. And, and this happens in every type of exfoliation. And if you got to see the fluorescence, you can see that the fluorescence is just on the borders of the sheets because it's where we really have a monolayer material. But uh, we can produce a lot of materials and then we, uh, we have uh, many monolayers uh, on, on this. And uh, this is the same, but this is the, the material prepared with the masking tape as the Nobel prices. And in this case, we prepare a terostructor where we have molybden disulfide, a molybden uh, and uh, tuxen uh, selenide. And uh, you see also that the monolayers are just in the borders. We can study, study the interaction of this type of material. And here is how we prepare materials by liquid phase exfoliation for the fabrications of applications. We can, for example, inter intercalate uh, ions. In this case, for example, could be lithium because lithium plus is very small and it can intercalate very easily into the, the sheets. And then just heat a bit and, and uh, by agitation, you can have uh, the exfoliated materials. 
The other thing is the sonic cations that I, I already told you that you need to choose very well the solvent to have an stable dispersion. Uh, how this uh, sonication works? Okay, when we have a liquid and we apply uh, acoustic field, what is uh, happen is that the, they they start to form bubble, a small a small little bubbles on all the solvents, and these bubbles start to absorb a lot of energy, and when and they cannot uh, uh, hold more this energy. They produce very high pressures at 1,000 atmospheres, and they produce very high uh, temperatures as, as high as 5,000 kelvins. But these are very localized, um, and they uh, um, disappear very fast. And then imagine this green are the bubbles that are going inside the graphene material in this case. And when they have this energy, the the bubbles implode, implode and separate the sheets. But in this case, if we do the ultrasonication in atmosphere, then we have oxygen. And oxygen is very good to produce radicals or, or hydroxyl radicals species that are very good breaking bonds. And then we need to take care. We can, for example, put a flux of nitrogen if we want to have big sheets of graphene or any other material in order to avoid the formation of radicals. And here is an example on how, what we don't need to do. If we sonicate for a short time, we have many layers materials. If we sonicate for a long time, we have monolayers, but very small and very destroyed. And here is the Raman signals where you can see the, the D band and the G band. The first one from here to there is the D band, where are the defects or sp3 carbon atoms. And the second band is the uh, the G band, where are the sp2 uh, carbon atoms? The last uh, signal in the Raman spectra, uh, we can know the number of layers of graphene that we have. And, and this can be corroborated by XPS analysis. When in the first case, we see that almost everything is carbon carbon bonds, but in the second case, it's carbon very destroyed or very oxygenated uh, with a lot of functionalities. And this is not good for developing materials. What we need to do is to control precisely the ultrasonication process in order to have big graphene sheets. These are big. <laughs> and uh, if you see, the sp3 carbon is very low, and it's mainly the atoms that are on the borders of the graphene sheet. And if the, the 2D band that is there is symmetric, this means that we have very few bands. Instead in graphite, we have a shoulder and very, very sharp peak. This is for, uh, for the um, layered graphite. And if you see in the XPS, we have some carbon oxygen bonds and carbon nitrogen bonds, but are mainly those that are on the edges. The materials, it's, uh, it's, it's good, the composition is good. And here is the high resolution TEM. If you see, you can see the hexagonal structure. This is very, very amazing that to use in a microscope, you can see how the atoms are arranged. You can measure the number of layers on the border, and you can see how these borders are. For example, in this case, borders are very destroyed. They have a lot of oxygen in the border, like this, and there you can see a straight borders. And then this is how you prepare by the ultrasonication technology. And now that we know how to produce these materials, we can start producing applications. And the first example I want to show you, this is a CERS uh, biosensor. CERS is surface and has Raman spectroscopy. And this is, uh, um, uh, it's made by nanoparticles. In this case, these gold nanoparticles that I, are grown on top of graphene. You see there is the graphene sheet on, on the bottom. And on top, we have all these uh, nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles. 
And this material is very good for sensing enzymes and coenzymes at uh, relevant biological uh, conditions. It is electrostatic, uh, electrochemically very stable and thermally also. If you see there, that is the TGI characterization uh, that the red one is the material with the particle are stable under a, a, a hundred uh, degrees. And this material is very good for sensing uh, this, uh, this is a coenzyme that, as, as you can imagine, coenzymes are very, very unstable. They need to have the buffer, uh, the phosphate or another biological buffer for the pH. They need to have uh, the, the right temperature and also the ionic force. And then it's very difficult to have a biosensor that you can work on these conditions and that works. And in this case, our material doesn't have any surfactant or any uh, tensioactive molecule covering the particles, and that's why it's very stable. And there, you can see that we can measure this coenzyme uh, with an, uh, an augment of, of one uh, to the fourth, and in the, in the detection limit is in the nanomolar. Another example, is that we have this molybden disulfide or, or tungsten disulfide, and uh, we put a uh, gold, uh, uh, silver nanoparticle. In this case, we use lithium to exfoliate the material. We exfoliate the materials, and then we did a plasma treatment. Where this plasma treatment is very important because when you have a material that it doesn't have defects. Uh, then it's very difficult that the material interact with the metal particles. We need to create defects on the surface. And then this plasma is a, a nitrogen plasma to, to put some nitrogen uh, covalently bonded to the surface. And then we put the, the argentum and they grow. And again, we want to use this material for sensing. In this case, we sense molecule that it has uh, fluorescence. Why we need a material to, to measure this type of, of molecule with fluorescence? Because, you know, uh, absorption and emission processes are uh, electronic transitions that are a, 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 a lot. Instead, Raman signal, it is a dispersion uh, process. It's the light that hits the matter and then disperses the photons. It's still an absorption, you have electronic transitions. And if you have fluorescence, like in this case, you cannot see the Raman spectra, the Raman signals, because the, the, the absorption is very high. And then all the Raman is covered by this absorption process. You need to quench the fluorescence like in that cork. We have rhodamine. And if you see the black one is just the molecule and the blue one that is the best is the molecule absorbed on the uh, molybdenite with the silver nanoparticle. There is a complete quenching of the fluorescence and then we can measure the, the Raman signals. And this is very useful to detect poloaromatics that uh, are toxic if we breathe them. And for example, pyrene, anthracene, of naphthalene, that they have fluorescence. And then if we put on this type of uh, platform, the fluorescence is quenched and we can clearly detect the Raman spectra. And, and how is this process? This is because these molecules are uh, flat molecules that they have this resonance. And if we put on top of the molybden disulfide, there is an interaction pi pi between these flat molecules, the electron on the pi orbitals interact with the surface, and then there is the quenching of the fluorescence. Another example is that we can develop materials for artificial photosynthesis. In this case, we have a this polyoxometallate that is a catalyst. It's a ruthenium polyoxometallin, and this ruthenium in the core of the catalyst donates four electrons to the water molecules by shining light, uh, sunlight, and these electrons break the molecule of water to produce hydrogen and oxygen. 
and how this is how material looks. You have the graphene on the bottom, and the poly, the polyoxometallite is on top of this. And you can do all the characterization, and it's very very nice because by electron microscopy you can see the 21 atoms, metallic atoms of the photocatalyst on top of the graphene. And, and this material is very good for the production of hydrogen. Uh, in blue, you have the efficiency uh, of the catalytic process uh, of, of the polyoxometallate alone, the catalyst alone. In red is a deposit on carbon nanotubes, and in, in green, is on graphene, and it's uh, one order of magnitude better, better than the catalyst alone. And uh, uh, here it's something that is uh, very important for the chemistry because we need to prepare these materials correctly. In this case, we have the catalyst anchored by a, a dendrite molecule. It's a large molecule that is it has positive charges to stabilize the, the polyoxometallite that it has negative charge. But if we use a small molecule, we can put more small molecules on the graphene surface, and we can put more catalysts on top. But that material, it has a higher loading of the catalyst, but it doesn't work for the catalyst. Because when we do these experiments in the high resolution TEM in real time, in this case, we can find 25 different configuration of the catalyst on surface on, of the graphene. In that case, we just found five. Then it's, this is very important because molecules are like big machines. They need to move to produce uh, the electrons for breaking the water. And they need to freely rotate on the surface. That's why this material is very good. And that one with more catalysts is not working in the process. Uh, this is another example. This material, uh, it is a uh, uh, molybdenum disulfide functionalized with core shell, uh, silver gold nanoparticles. And this material is used for uh, as a catalyst as well for breaking uh, the rhodamine that is a pollutant, a colorant pollutant in water, but using uh, uh, sunlight. And the material creates uh, electrons and holes, and the electron are traps by the molecules. Uh, this, the oxygen produces radical species, and the radical species break the rhodamine uh, in, in small molecules. And uh, this is an example or a biological application. If we want to use graphene for biological application, we need to put a graphene in water. And to this, we cannot do it because uh, a graphene is hydrophobic and that we need to use something to create a, a, an interaction between the graphene and the water. And we use this molecule that is called chlorine E6. It's, uh, it's an analog of, of, the, of the chlorophyll without the magnesium ion in the center. And this uh, molecule, it, it has uh, very good properties absorbing the light. It is a, a, a molecule that has this part that are the oxygenated function that are hydrophilic. And then the flat part of the molecules absorbs on the graphene sheets and then we can disperse graphene in water. And we use this material in photodynamic therapy, and we put this on light. In this case, in this case, it's red light. We did this arrangement of lace of uh, diodes uh, of red light that is uh, uh, biologically compatible. It does hurt us, and uh, we irradiate this material and produce radical species that are very good for killing, in this case, fungus. This is Candida albicans. That is a very bad fungus in the hospitals. It can kill persons if they have a, a, a bad immunological system. 
And this, this fungus is very resistant to antibiotics because we have used a lot of antibiotics and this now we cannot kill them. And in this case, with red light or very low po uh, power, we can produce radical species. Uh, and that uh, curve is um, a sensor for the production of radical species. And you can see that the, the chlorine alone uh, produce very uh, small quantities of radicals instead of graphene sheet produce a lot of radical species. This is because graphene is donating electrons to the to the molecule. And then if we see if you see the only way to kill the colons of this fungus is when we have the graphene sheet exposed to the light uh, with the with the molecule and then uh, the fungus are dead. And this was a collaboration with Jamin Ni, who did the PhD in Mexico, a collaboration with China. With China. He studied what happened to, to this, um, uh, this are molybden disulfide. No, this, uh, no, it's a uh, tungsten selenite when we uh, put some uh, metallic uh, atoms like palladium, uh, uh, silver, gold, uh, platinum. Because as I told you, if we have the surface without any defect, they don't interact with anything. And Jamin uh, uh, compute what happened with the electronic states of these materials when you introduce these metallic acids, uh, metallic uh, atoms. And then he uh, uh, also by computer simulation, he uh, did the absorption of CO2 and of two and SO2 that are contaminant pollutant gases. And he saw that uh, when these materials are doped with these metals are very good for sensing NO2, can uh, work as sensors. Um, he also did these uh, calculations. In this case, it, uh, it's a standard bilateral structure. If, I, if you remember, when you have one layer and you put another different layer and they interact by electrostatic forces are called standard bilateral structures. And this is a, 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 a German carbide or silicon carbide a, a structure. And what he did is to stretch them unaxial and biaxial, and he calculates again how the electrons behave on, on this structure to see how the electronic properties of these materials changes. And this is uh, very important for the future development of uh, electronics, when you want to have flexible electronics, uh, like batches or other. In this case, what is happening that if, you if we have one semiconducting material, we have other semiconducting materials, each of them will have exciton properties, different band gap. And what happens when we put the two layers of the different semiconductors, they behave as if they were one. And then with this, we can control the excitonic properties of this type of materials. And this is uh, what he studied to do a catalyst in the visible life also for, for breaking the water molecules. And in this case, he, he saw that the best materials is the combination of uh, tungsten disulfide with indium selenide to absorb light in the visible range. And with this, we have a lot of perspective perspective. I don't want to do like uh, the conclusions because there are no conclusions, there are many perspectives that we can integrate these nanomaterials in nanofluidics. That is what we are working now. We can produce holes or we can produce channels of pore in this type of structure to make membranes for many different properties because these uh, materials are very stable, are very strong, they conduct uh, charges, and we can apply different fields and they will be very resistant. And then all these properties that we just uh, uh, mentioned will make that this membrane uh, will be low energy consumption and we can develop this for the different applications. 
in these materials, it has been studied that water flows without any friction, and that this can be very good also for these uh, processes to recover, for example, materials that are in very low um, concentration in in different things. Here are how this, this uh, uh, membrane can work. It can be by the size of the pores, we can uh, uh, separate molecules, or by charges, we can keep some species trapped on the membranes and recover the others, or by different uh, mechanisms uh, at put uh, diffusion. And it's important that these materials are very strong. And in this case, this experiment, it was made to demonstrate that is we start to apply a gas flux on this membrane, the membrane won't break and helium is trapped in here. Then graphene is impermeable. We need to produce pores or holes for the, we can create the pores and to do this type of membranes is very easy because the only thing that we need to do is a vacuum filtration process. And we, we just need to take care of produce it correctly because if we do this very fast, we will have a lot of swelling. The material will absorb a lot of water and, and it, it's, uh, and we can do also mixtures of these materials to produce the, the membranes. And, uh, now what we are working is for water desalination, and we have very nice results at uh, um, atmospheric conditions. We don't need to apply pressure, and we are separating, we are desalinating the water. Also, we are removing microorganisms. In this, in this case, it's the Philococcus aureus, that is uh, very common in the water in Mexico. And with this type of membranes, it's very easy to remove them. And then the perspective at this, we want to clean water from different contaminants, any type of contaminants. We want to do a harvesting of energy to, like, for example, to produce uh, supercapacitors, or, or we want to separate things that are uh, used, are useful in very low quantities. And these are my students in Mexico. And yeah, I want to thank for the, all the collaboration. Here we have the Wuhan University of Technology and the funding for Conacyt. And I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you Nibet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because of that uh, computer problem, so we have yeah, passed the one know. hour. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's not your fault. That's not your fault. That's uh, that that problem with the computers. So I have chance to that uh, one or two questions. Do you have any questions? Don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> Okay, so no if no <laughs> questions, that uh, you have that still have that uh, two weeks uh, here, so maybe that student can that uh, uh, discuss that uh, something that with you that during that uh, you are staying in here. Okay. 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 <laughs>